This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. I don't really know how I felt because I'd never had anything to do with anything like that before, so you sort of expected something drastic to happen almost immediately, I think, but it didn't. Uh, I was out walking when the, it was given out and I went back to find my sister in tears over the sink because she remembered the 1418 war, so she wasn't very happy about things at all. It was a lovely sunny day and I remember it was about 11 o'clock in the morning that uh, war was announced. Well, it was a lovely day. It was a beautiful morning. And uh, I well remember uh, the evening as well. I know the foreman come busting into my bedroom at uh, midnight and he said, well, what do you think about it now, chum? And I said, I don't think there'll be a war. I knew from uh, one or two other men in that how sad it was to, to have to throw away perfectly good plants, plants which had been tended for years, and uh, to see them thrown away on the fire reap or on the compost heap. It was, uh, it was a period of, of great sadness. Harry Dodson, head gardener at Chiltern Gardens, relives the moment of heartache that faced many gardeners in 1939. A few miles away in her country cottage, cook Ruth Mott prepares to cope again with the shortages of the wartime kitchen. Together they will show how the skills of the gardener and the cook fed the nation during five long years of war. Using the advice, recipes and methods of the time, they will return to the days when everyone had to make the most of what they could get. Wish me luck as you wave me goodbye. At first, people had no idea what to expect. They feared the bombers would come at once. They didn't, nor did the shortages. As the troops left for France, Many people believed it would be all over by Christmas. This unexpected reprieve gave people a chance to prepare themselves. With government encouragement, storing and preserving the autumn harvest took on a new urgency. Old skills were called up, like drying apple rings. Now I'm cutting this into about six or eight rings. This is a nice apple because it's soft and so it will dry out because that's the object of the manoeuvre and then we can keep these for the rest of the winter or quite a long time. We're going also to light a sulphur candle and turn the jar up over it so that it will fill with fumes and then that will stop the apple hopefully discolouring. They bound to go a little bit brown because of the drying out process. Put the jar over the top and leave it there till the candle goes out. I have a saucer ready so that when the candle's gone out you can pop that over the top quickly to keep your fumes in and then we'll pop in the apple rings and give them a good shake. We don't use this method very much today because it takes quite, it's quite a long process. Well, that's, <coughs> that's enough for that, so we'll 
quickly pop the saucer over the top to keep the fumes in and get our apple rings ready to drop in. We want them to go in as much as we can singly. I'm trying to do them like that so that I don't lose too much stuff. And then just drop them in one at a time. That'll be enough. And put the lid back on and give them a good shake to make sure that they get enveloped with the fumes. And then they shouldn't discolour too much. And then we're going to thread them onto these little sticks and put them in a very, very low oven to dry out. Well, you want a very, very low oven, as low as you can get it. Um, just a bit below what we call milk pudding temperature, or just about one or two, just to keep it very low, because they want to dry out very slowly, which will take them about six to eight hours as a rule. You know when they're done, when they feel like leather, because they've then got no moisture left in them at all. And then they'll probably have crinkled a little bit, but you can... When you get them out, you can sort of just straighten them between your hands and then you can let them, you must let them cool off and then you can pack them into a, a tin. It need not be airtight for using at a later date. And then you will soak them then so that you put the moisture back in so that you should have had a nice apple then or make a puree or something of them. If no bombers appeared over the skies of Britain, U-boats certainly prowled the coastal waters. Their presence brought home to the government and the country the fact that 60% of Britain's food was imported. Onions flourish in the warmer climate of France and Spain. They were an early casualty of the restrictions on imports. They quickly disappeared from the shops, but the country estates had always grown and stored their own onions. From now on, it's fairly straightforward. You want, as near as possible, a couple of onions the same size, and you wind the tops round like that. They, they need, really, about three inches of pretty same top. And then you just put them around, twist them like that, those two didn't want to go quite where one wants them, and it, that often happens. But it, it comes right in the end. You want to keep, keep the rope going even. Now the next ones will come so that they fill in that hole. A lot of people have got the idea that these are tied on. Um, good garden fashion and good old kitchen gardeners, I've never seen any of them ever tie them on. It was always used by this method. I've been chattering and not paying too much attention to what I'm doing and one or two of the old boys wouldn't have been very proud of this string. It's not so bad. Among those evacuated in the first days of the war were mothers with young children. Joyce and her small son Paul arrived from London. Ruth, like so many others, must learn to share her kitchen. With the gardens depleted of young men, a new workforce filled the gap. The volunteers of the Women's Land Army. This is the army, Mr. Jones. No private rooms or telephones. Straight from typing pools and shop counters, the girls were interviewed, given a brief training, and sent wherever they were needed. This is the army, Mr. Oh, hello. Um, is this Chilton Gardens? It is, yes. Oh, hello, I'm Annie Medlin. 
So pleased to meet you. you. I've been expecting you. Good. So if you put your bicycle there, I'll take you out into the gardens where your labours will be required. <laughs> All right. The girls had to go where, wherever they was asked to go. And my uncle had them, and he had one or two very good ones, and he spoke highly of them. And I don't doubt that many, many men found them extremely useful and uh, would have been very, very hard pushed to have kept up with uh, the gathering of crops and that sort of thing, uh, without the aid of the, uh, the lad girls. We get a few summer crops off of it, and then... Uh, we crush up some autumn crops again. A pool of tractors was created to help bring land into production. At Chilton, a derelict orchard is to make way for vegetables. If you decided to be registered for food production or elected to turn your garden and glass houses over to food production, uh, you were expected to turn out a minimum of 75% foodstuff. Uh, I think it was pegged at that because it was understood that uh, that would bait me the maximum that some of these gardens would be able to turn out because of the sizes of the paths and that sort of thing. As the months of enemy inactivity dragged on, the nightly blackout became a more and more irritating restriction. We don't let any light out. I think we all like to draw our curtains the other side of the blackout so that your room looked cosy and it didn't look so dreary, because blackout really was a dreary looking thing. And then of course when you came up to bed at night, you still had to have your blackout up. So you felt sort of very shut in with it all the time. The biggest grumble was reserved for the plans to introduce rationing. Within days of war breaking out, a Ministry of Food was set up. It was given powers to control the purchase and distribution of all food supplies. Its main instrument was the ration book, issued to every man, woman and child in the country. Well, first of all, you were told where to go and collect your ration books. And they were dished out in our local village hall, and you went and collected them, and then you brought them home and you decided who you thought you would like to register with. Mrs. Mott, do you mind if I read your newspaper? No, not at all. You registered with whatever, if you're grocer, you had to ask them if they would accept you. Possibly if you were a bad payer, he perhaps wouldn't feel too happy about taking you. Um, also, you registered with your butcher and, uh, you know, then you just went to those each week and got what you were entitled to. You couldn't, if you didn't take your ration this week, you couldn't put it off until next week and have a double ration. The older people told you that how lucky you were that rationing was going to be introduced so early because in the First World War it wasn't introduced till 1917 and all the early part of the war they used to go all over the place to uh, find things if it was in the shops because it went in possibly to the town more than it did to the villages. So this was a very equal way of serving it out even if it was small. Well, I think everybody thought they were hard done by, 
In the country, we felt they did better in the town, and in the town, they thought you did better in the country. I mean, we had access to rabbits, eggs, uh, perhaps a drop more milk, various things like that. In the town, of course, they knew the minute that the fish was in the fish shop. Uh, they had the advantage of queuing for cigarettes, which would only be in a very, very small amount in the village. In the glass houses of estate gardens like Chiltern, thousands of ornamental plants had to be destroyed to make way for food crops. But if, like these climbing roses, they took up little space, they could be spared. Harry digs the recently cleared bed to grow early cauliflowers. Glass houses were a great asset as they provided vegetables at a time of year when there was a shortage of fresh greens. With so many evacuees arriving in the country, accommodation for land girls was a serious problem. Many had to put up with crowded hostels, unsuitable bothies and insanitary digs. Annie's lucky. She's billeted with a family in a nearby market town. Her lodgings have a garden which she helps look after in her spare time. The house backs onto a railway line, a target for enemy aircraft, so it qualifies for an Anderson shelter. Named after the Home Secretary, Sir John Anderson, the shelter quickly became the butt of wartime humour. While we were arguing the toss within, the bride and bridegroom slipped off on their honeymoon. Oh, that's good. Where'd they spend it? In the Anderson? <clears throat> <laughs> It was a simple, effective, if somewhat leaky protection against all but a direct hit. Has there any moon in the Anderson? Well, it's next best thing to Blackpool, plenty of sand and water. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A covering of earth was recommended as extra protection. This also replaced the valuable growing space lost when the shelter was erected. Annie spreads compost before planting trailing marrows. The government condemned hoarding, but encouraged stocking up the larder with homemade preserves. Ruth stores eggs for the winter. Well, we've had these eggs given to us because the chickens are laying well at the moment, so we're going to try and preserve these so that we can use them for cooking. They'll also make a good omelette and scrambled egg, but they don't boil terribly well. So we're going to pop them into here, having made the water glass already. And I was always taught to put them in the pointed end down, and then the yolk stays fairly central into the middle. If you do them the other way up, it's not so easy. And then we can put these into the water glass, and then we can keep adding to them as we get the odd egg that we're not going to use and it's nice and fresh and we can pop it in so we hope to get the basket full eventually we should take the basket to the solution and lower it in carefully from there uh, with as little movement as possible so that you won't crack any of the eggs and that should be covered with water glass the bulk of Britain's eggs and chicken food was imported now, with limited animal feed coming into the country, it was the dairy farmer, not the poultry keeper, who got priority. An egg shortage was clearly just round the corner. I met a little fellow with a letter in his hand. 
asked me if I'd post it in the box for Fairyland. I slipped it in the mail. The war was not over by Christmas, and many people were spending it far from their families. Despite there being goods in the shops, there was deep anxiety about what the new year would bring. Saves a string to do up the Christmas pudding. Thank you. It's a night light. When we look back now to years gone by to a dark and stormy the sun. 